uh, welcome. Uh, my name's uh, Troy Lanigan. I'm the outgoing uh, chair of Rural Taxpayers Association and been involved with the taxpayers movement in Canada for uh, several years and have my hand in a few other projects which I'll talk about um, in a second. I just I wanted to say how much I enjoyed the sessions this morning. They were fantastic and, and why is because they were grounded in telling stories. Um, I had to laugh at uh, um, uh, Matt and Terry this morning. If my wife and I did that, it would last about five minutes because she's on the left of the, of the spectrum, which makes always for interesting conversation uh, between us. But I love the, con the, the stories of the people that made that journey uh, through their convictions this morning. They're very powerful and very memorable. So um, this is about storytelling and video. It's about how we communicate but how we uh, communicate effectively. So let me start by way of, a, of an illustration I like to use. When, um, before I <laughs> became a rather Rubenesque bald man, uh, I used to do uh, triathlon a lot. And um, I can tell you a bit about triathlon. Um, it's swimming, it's biking, it's running, and it's in that order. And the distance vary. An Olympic triathlon is 1.5 kilometers. It's a 40 kilometer uh, bike. And it's a 10 kilometer run. You can also do a sprint distance, which is half of that distance. Um, the granddaddy of uh, triathlon is called the Ironman. That's a 3.8 kilometer swim. It's a 180 kilometer bike. It's a 42.2 kilometer run. Uh, and for those of the Americans and the, and the British in the audience, that's 2.4 miles, 112 miles, and 26.2 miles in that distance. Um, at every stage in an Ironman, there's cutoffs, and if you don't make them, your day is over really quick. There's also a half Ironman, and half of those distance if you want to do the math. Now, I could tell you and describe the sport of triathlon the way I just have, or I could tell it to you through a story. And... I used to be quite involved with the triathlon club back home, and we'd bring in speakers every couple of weeks. And one of my favorite stories I ever heard was a fellow named Don Tarlson. And Don had lost one of his arms in an accident. And so he still loved the sport of triathlon and still competed in it, but he competed as a paratriathlon, so he's physically disabled. But Don never had a prosthetic when he uh, competed in, in triathlon. So one year he was competing at an event in San Diego and he was getting ready for a competition. And he looks across uh, the park and he sees a fellow with his back toward him on a park bench. And he sees that he's putting a, a prosthetic. He sees he has one arm, but he's putting a prosthetic on the arm. And Don says, this is BS. I don't wear a prosthetic when I compete in this event. So he starts marching over to this fella. And as he comes around the other side of the bench, he's about to give him what for. And he looks down, and he sees the man has no legs. Don turns when he speaks to us, and he says, how deep does a man have to look into his soul to complete a triathlon with one arm? So telling stories goes back 100,000 years. Stories is how we transferred knowledge from generation to generation. About 27,000 years ago, we added pictures, cave drawings, to transfer knowledge from generation to generation. 3,500 years ago, we added written words to pass knowledge. Stories are very much part of our DNA. Think about this. If I tell you a story about how to survive, you'll be more likely to survive than if I give you just facts. So I like this illustration. There is an animal over there near that tree, don't go there. Versus saying, my cousin was eaten by a malicious, scary creature that lurks around that tree, don't go over there. I just gave you an example about 90 seconds ago. Can anyone tell me, that's not a triathlete, how long the swim distance is in an Ironman? Ah, it's always a smart ass in the crowd, eh? <laughs> One guy. 
But can you remember the fellow on the bench? Absolutely. And that's the power, right, of telling stories. So I've been coming to dozens of conferences like this, reading materials. Um, and we, it's the same message. I mean, we've heard this many, many times. In order for us to be more successful as a movement, we need to tell more stories, more narratives. And we all nod, and then we all walk out the room, and we head home, and we start talking about the GDP of this, the elasticity of that, the income deciles, propensity to consume. Actually, my favorite is the word billion. You might as well say kajillion, and we use it all the time. Right? Um, there was a survey done by our national magazine in Canada, a news magazine, Maclean's. They actually surveyed Canadians. Only 26% of Canadians could say how many zeros were in a billion. Maybe we're not, maybe we're not too smart up north, but <laughs> I suspect the statistic wouldn't be uh, too much different anywhere else. So it's not that we shouldn't do that work, and it's not that it's not important, and I don't mean to be putting it down. It's just that I think in the liberty think tank move it, it's disproportionately in that direction. And so that's why the work that's being done by our panelists and many others increasingly is so important. Um, we, we can and should work to advance our ideas to a greater extent through stories because it is shown to be at the heart of persuasive and lasting communication. There's a lot of studies, you can look them up online. I saw one Stanford University study. Information is 22 times more likely to be remembered if it is weaved into narratives. So just quickly, I'll share a couple of things I'm involved with and then I'll introduce our panel and take it over. So I was 26 years with the Taxpayers Association in Canada. We're a little slow, but we started to finally be conscious uh, to start weaving in stories. So if you wanted to talk about um, the revenue agency reforms, for example. We found a story, right? So a fella was audited by the revenue agency. They took all the papers out of his office back to conduct this audit. And they were, quote unquote, accidentally shredded. Yet they still assessed him taxes on the basis of this material that was all shredded. And so to call for reform of the agency, we actually built around the narrative of this fellow's story. And it was interesting to listen to fundraising discussion um, earlier today. To the extent you can build stories into fundraising appeals, I mean, our experience over the years has been those are the most, um, the most successful that you'll, you'll have. Um, the second um, item is I've, I've left the Taxpayers Federation and having believed this and, and talked about this so long, uh, my colleague and I just simply wrote up a business plan to say, what if we created a think tank um, but only uh, presented ideas of public policy reform through stories? And if it doesn't fit in a story, um, then we're simply not uh, going to do it. Um, so, for example, uh, we have a really, really bad health care system in Canada. And for you Americans in the room, I think nine of your 20 uh, Democratic uh, candidates seeking the nomination praise Canada as a great model, single, single tier, uh, single payer health care. So rather than give statistics about how long the wait lists are, et cetera, et cetera, we've just simply gone out and started interviewing people that are sitting on wait lists and are in pain and suffering and building the case for reform around the actual experiences and the stories of those, of those people. So um, this is a project we just got up and running. Um, it's only been up for a couple of months, so it's not setting the world on fire yet, but I think we're learning as we go and I think the stories will get better and um, there's been a lot of uptake of it so far. So anyway, that's, uh, I just wanted to say that about that. Our projects, um, we have, um, I'll, I'll switch now to the, the panelists, we'll maybe talk about some of this stuff more. Um, we have three great panelists, I've had a chance to, uh, to meet them all, I'll let you read their bios online, I won't go into, into great detail. Um, ben Wimpy's a, a film producer uh, here in Australia with IndyMax uh, Productions. Uh, Miriam Issa is a, a, a media correspondent, host, and producer uh, based out of Los Angeles, if you heard her speak this morning. Um, and Matt Kibbety, Kibbe, a great entrepreneur of the Liberty Movement, um, probably best known for his many years with Freedom Works, but now is involved with, with Free the People. And I have to say one interesting sidebar. 
Matt is the only person whose path to uh, the liberty movement actually started with a Canadian. I don't know that... <laughs> I think it's the first person I've ever said that about in my life. Um, but if anyone in the room knows who Neil Pert is, and if you don't, then maybe uh, um, Matt can tell you. So with that, um, yeah. Miriam, do you want to start? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, by the way, everyone for being here and for so generously giving us your listening. So some people believe that culture makes us who we are, right? That's called cultural determinism. Others believe in technological determinism or genetic determinism. I personally believe that what makes us who we are are stories. And there is a moment in the season finale of Game of Thrones which perfectly illustrates this point. How many people here watch Game of Thrones? Okay, great. So Are you if you say it, I got it recorded at home. I was just going to say there was a spoiler alert. So if you somehow, if you watch the show and you have not caught up on the last episode, what are you waiting for? You can't continue avoiding the internet forever. I had, I had to come to Australia. Oh, yeah, that's true. That was important. Uh, there is a tiny little spoiler. Um, so please cover your ears okay, for the next 15 seconds. No, this is very serious. He will kill me if he doesn't cover his ears. So, okay, here we go. So. In the scene, the lords of the fictional land, I feel terrible for what I'm doing to you. Oh my God, okay. terrible years leading up to this moment and I just ruined it for him. Okay, so. Just watch the emotional turmoil of this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay, so the lords of the fictional land of Westeros are trying to decide who will be crowned the ruler of the Seven Kingdoms. And that's when Tyrion Lannister, played by Peter Dinklage, ends up making a case for the least likely character. Mm, so sorry. A paraplegic named Bran Stark, who is also the keeper of the world's memories. So why Bran? Well, here's what Tyrion says. He asks, what unites people? Is it armies, gold, flags? No, it's stories. How you doing over there? I'm okay. Oh, I'm so sorry. There's nothing in the world more powerful than a good story. Nothing can stop it. No enemy can defeat it. And who has a better story than Bran the Broken, the boy who fell from a high tower and lived? He is our memory, the keeper of all of our stories. The wars, the weddings, the births, the massacres, the famines, our triumphs, our defeats, our past. Who better to lead us into the future? So as Tyrion points out, Stories pave the path for who we will become. And if what we all in here have in common is that we want to tell stories that sell the values that the rights to life, liberty, and property should be the most important values, then we must sell those values not just through analytics, which speak to the mind, but through storytelling, which speaks to the heart. And of course we need facts. Facts give stories substance, but stories give facts meaning. And a fact without meaning, well, that's just as persuasive as listening to a TED talk on mute. It doesn't move the needle. So when I think of how, thank you, when I think of how in 2008, the most socially progressive state in the United States, California, could not legalize gay marriage. In fact, we voted to ban it. And then I consider that in 2015, same-sex marriage was the law of the land. I have to ask myself, what happened in that space that so radically moved the needle in the hearts of the people? I have some theories. 10 seasons of Modern Family, 16 seasons of The Ellen DeGeneres Show, and an endless array of gay and trans pop stars and YouTubers. Or I'll give you another example. The election of President Barack Obama. However you may feel about his politics, it is a fact that that man was elected by the same, some of the very same constituents who decades earlier would never have elected a black person as school superintendent, much less president of the United States. But you know what happened? The 90s happened. The 90s black boy bands and girl groups and 90s sitcoms about lovable black families that were suddenly, suddenly flooding TV sets inside of white living rooms, where in some cases a black person had never even stepped foot. But all of a sudden, their brown voices were being heard in these white living rooms and their brown narratives were being humanized. So you might think that it's a very big and dramatic leap for me to say that the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air teaching us how to rap 
somehow got Barack Obama elected or that Family Matters Steve Urkel and his undying love for Laura Winslow somehow got Barack Obama elected. But you know what? I say, how could it not? Considering that 30 years earlier, lynchings were still a part of our American cultural lexicon. As soon as, I mean, we can go way before the 90s, as you were just saying, as soon as man discovered fire, he discovered the amazement of sitting around a fire and telling stories. We are wired to receive information through stories, which now begs the question for us, how do we tell stories that persuade minds, that disarm egos, and that touch hearts? So here's my recipe. First of all, we need to consider that how you get your stories has radically changed in the last 20 years, making it harder and harder to reach listeners who are not already seeking your ideological message. What I mean by that is 20 years ago, when you wanted to hear a story, you put it on the TV, you got your remote control, and it didn't matter if you were a Republican or a Democrat, the options were the same on the television. That is not the case anymore, because the algorithm in most media platforms is now designed to expose us to the content that we are most likely to engage with based on the content that we've already engaged with. Which means that when your goal is to break through the media echo chambers and reach the unconverted, that is a super difficult job. So you then might be tempted to use anger as your trigger. Now as someone who has launched millions of YouTube episodes and YouTube programming with like hundreds of millions of views, I understand very well that the trigger that is most likely to elicit a click on my video is a title and a thumbnail that is going to piss you the F off. I've made money using your anger as my weapon. And that's why news sources keep feeding us these stories because they're working. We keep watching, we keep clicking, we keep reading. So while that anger trigger is supremely effective at reinforcing your current audience's loyalty, it is also very effective at pushing away the unconverted minds even further and further in the opposite direction. So how do we reach echo chambers and captivate, or how do we go beyond echo chambers and captivate new minds given these obstacles? Here is what I suggest. This is super important. And I think you should do this not only in your storytelling in media, but also in your storytelling in real life, in your interactions with people. Make a compelling argument for both sides. So most arguments look like this. Here's like the guy on the right being like, well, I think it should be this way. And then the guy on the left is like, well, I think it should be this way. And then the guy on the right is like, well, I think it should be this way. And then the guy on the left is like, I should be, think it should be this way. And then it's so excruciating that the only thing that makes you feel better is turning the whole conversation off and watching a rerun of Keeping Up with the Kardashians. And that's when you know things are bad, okay? So instead, it's something that I call reflection. Start with the rebuttal. Humanize their story. Tell their rebuttal, their story, better than they can. And then follow it up with your story. Because now you've left the audience feeling heard, feeling sympathized, and they don't have a rebuttal because you started your argument with their side of the story, leaving them open to receiving a new point of view. All right. I also want to give you an example of how sometimes you need to soften the message in order to have it land. Everyone watches Netflix in here, right? Okay, of course, you're normal. Um, has any, how many of you have discovered the show Fauda? Nobody, okay. So Fauda is this hit show in Israel. It's this Israeli show about an Israeli soldier that comes out of retirement to hunt down a guy from Hamas. This soldier is I mean, this show is huge in Israel. It is a massive, epic hit. In fact, every year, the trailer to the next season is the most viewed show on YouTube in Israel, every single year. Now, what's really interesting is that when the creators first developed the show, they thought that show was gonna be an epic failure on their resume. Why did they think that? Because they wanted to create a show that showed both sides of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And they knew that Israeli audiences generally don't care about listening about the Palestinian side of the argument, not in their media. But the show was a hit. So um, a lot of Palestinians have ca called for the boycott of this show because they claim that the show does not accurately tell their side of the story. And they're right. But if the show did, 
it wouldn't be on air at all. It would have never existed past episode one. The show's creators wanted to humanize these Palestinians that Israelis are rarely ever exposed to. So what they do is they include just enough of the Palestinian side so that it lands beyond the comfort zone of their Israeli audiences and it gets them to think and reflect on topics that they normally don't reflect on, but not so far into their discomfort zone that the show is canceled. So Fauda has done more to awaken empathy from Israelis toward Palestinians than any other Israeli show in recent television history there. Now, the creators even received letters from fans often telling them, oh my God, before this show, I never even thought about them on the other side. And thanks to Fauda, I'm suddenly caring about what they must be struggling with on the other side. So that shows that sometimes you gotta soften the message because at least it will be received instead of being a purist, but no one heard it. Now, Fauda might be trying to move the needle, but it's not doing, it hasn't been able to do enough, and the evidence for that is the recent Israeli elections. One show will not do enough. Just as one Ellen DeGeneres will not get gay marriage the law of the land. You need a multi-pronged media strategy to win the culture war. What I mean by that is you need multiple TV shows, you need multiple movies, you need multiple podcasts and news outlets. You need things like long form intellectual analysis like what you'd find on a podcast, but you need some funny short videos on YouTube as well because we are all constantly being fed a steady diet of media propaganda. We're all gonna go to YouTube no matter what. So if it's not your voices being heard on YouTube, it's someone else's. So get in there, get in all of the spaces and make your voices heard. And for my final point, has anyone seen this book before? It's called Zoom. So, what do we see here? All right, what do you see here? What do you see here? What do you see here? So the point, the point of this book is to show you, where are my notes? The point of this book is to show you that when you zoom into a story versus when you zoom out of a story, it exposes a completely different context to the subject matter. If you want people to be able to zoom out and understand the greater picture, the greater lesson on any one of these issues that's supremely important to us, you first have to zoom in and make the story super specific. Pick one person with a compelling story and tell their story. And once you have grabbed people by zooming in, then zoom out for the final conclusion. So, actually an example of that is the Syrian refugee crisis. No one was talking about the Syrian refugee crisis despite all the numbers and the millions of the displaced people around the world, etc. until all of a sudden a Syrian boy washed up ashore on a Turkish beach and all of a sudden it's all everyone was talking about. So one dead child humanized millions. So to recap, Effective storytelling for winning the culture war must disarm the ego, persuade the mind, and touch the heart. And to do that, you can't rely on just one good show. You have to exist on every kind of media platform. And while anger is the nerve most likely to get a video click, it is the nerve least likely to convert a mind that's on the other side. So tell your story and tell their story. And soften that story if you need to in order to make it palatable. And finally, zooming in, make the story specific and compelling before zooming out. Um, if you wanna win the culture war, my final point is if you wanna win the culture war, don't tell stories that destroy the enemy. Tell stories that make the enemy your ally. That is the real way of winning the culture war. Reframe it, don't make it a war, and don't make them your enemy. They're just a temporary opponent. Tell stories that unite. Thank you. That was wonderful, Miriam. And uh, I'm feeling a little bit awkward going after you. That was, uh, that was very, very dynamic, very, very effective. Um, uh, I'm not a speaker. I thought I'll kind of caveat this by saying I'm not really a, a speaker. I'm a filmmaker. 
Uh, I uh, Tim Andrews asked me to speak last year, threw me into a panel uh, for the, I think, the students' uh, libertarian section, and um, uh, and now he brought me back this year. Uh, I don't know why, based on what I spoke last year, but, um, but that's okay. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I know. Um, firstly, uh, I probably shouldn't be here. Uh, my father's a carpenter, um, and I grew up in Bandura, which is a Labor safe seat for forever. Um, and he probably should vote Labor, and uh, and I'm a filmmaker, so I probably should also be in the arts, asking money from the government to make the things that I do. But uh, through a series of uh, adventures, uh, I find myself at the Libertarian Conference and um, things have made sense. Uh, I wanted to make films, but it didn't make sense to ask to write the kinds of films that it seemed to be that the government wanted me to make. I, I just didn't make sense to me. I wanted to be uh, I wanted to make a return on my investment. I wanted to reach an international audience uh, and I then uh, found myself kind of asking other strange questions about, uh, as a business person, I, I couldn't understand why I had to pay uh, taxes on certain things. Like if I, if I, I didn't feel incentivized to grow my business and then pay payroll tax. And I, I, I kept struggling to understand how the whole thing worked. Anyway, uh, long story short, um, because I'm a filmmaker, I run a production company, and uh, so I'm often invited to uh, film other conferences. And so I found myself behind a camera here about three or four years ago. And before I knew it, the stories of the libertarian movement and the sense of freedom started to make more and more sense to me. And I found myself more and more compelled with some of the language that was, was happening here and, and more and more interested. And, and probably the best way I would say it is, is it started off with a little sip. But unfortunately, I have to say, and please don't, well, I, you can't be offended because my understanding of the libertarian movement is you, you can't really be offended. Um, but um, I think libertarian I think libertarianism has a brand problem. Um, and I often help companies um, solve brand problems. They come to me and they say, we need to tell the story of our business or we need to tell the story of our issue. And I couldn't help but experience, like, again, I was a little bit green and naive, but I found myself in, in, in surrounded by people who were giving me some sort of libertarianism babble. I, I didn't understand it. It was all these words and these theories and these people that I didn't know and these concepts that I didn't understand, and I just thought you were all Fruit Loops. Um, and unfortunately, however, the core message of freedom kept coming out and this kind of persistence of this freedom. And I thought, I, could, I can handle that. I like that. And then as I started hearing different perspectives on that same theme, I started to become more and more interested. So I took more and more sips. And more and more, I started to kind of understand some of the, thought, the theories and, the, and all that sort of stuff. I, I, look, I'm, I'm still a filmmaker, so I like to keep things pretty simple. I like to just tell stories. Um, but my stories, unless they move the audience, uh, I'm kind of just not making any sense. So I've got a few things to show. And I've got a few things to share. Um, but I do want to also, before I do that, I just want to say, just because I've accused you of having a brand problem doesn't mean that you're the only ones. Um, the church has a brand problem. If you think about it, they have an incredibly core value message that is incredible. Like, if you've ever kind of looked at the story of Jesus Christ, it is an absolutely amazing transformational story. And if you hear people tell their story about how this, this figure has impacted them, you can't help but see the fruit that comes out of that. That there's this, this story of this man who basically gave up his life um, for everybody. And this is story of love and grace and all that kind of stuff. It's great. But so often the church is perceived as an angry mob or as they're, they're throwing these, these kind of biblical theories at you and this, this, this historical kind of truths and all these kind of things that kind of make no sense. So it's okay, they can probably learn from some of these things too and we can learn some incredible simple things to kind of move this movement forward and get to the actual heart of your story, which I think is about freedom. 
So I'm gonna. I, I'm not sure who was here at the dinner last night. Okay, cool. Uh, half and half. So sorry to the half that have seen this. But we opened up the conference last night with uh, with this. Now, here, watch the filmmaker struggle with technology. Uh, here we go. So, oh, here we go. Awesome. Okay. Now, uh, now I'm going to wander over here. This is a PC, unfortunately. I'm used to a Mac. Um, all right. Here we go. The story of our blue green planet is a story of a people fighting to be free. Free from hunger, free from the violence of the weather and the violence of other more powerful creatures. Free of oppression from disease and free of oppression from our fellow man. Free to think, free to believe, free to speak, free to pursue our own happiness. For thousands of years and hundreds of generations, freedom has been our goal our relentless pursuit. But just as hunger returns if we stop fighting to create food, just as disease returns if we stop fighting to be healthy, so oppression returns if we stop fighting to be free. So it falls to us in our generation to fight for our freedom and teach the next generation to do the same. To fight against government overreach, unjust laws, unjust taxation, against the oppression of those who would be kings over their fellow man. The fight of our forebears has become our fight. This is our time. This is our fight. We will fight to be free. So basically, uh, thank you. So now, the intention of that video was to open up uh, the dinner. And it was intended to be inspirational. It, it had a particular genre that we approached. It didn't try to go into policies. It didn't try to go into mantra. It didn't try to do anything else but talk about freedom, to invite you on a journey. The other thing is it placed you as the audience within that story. It asked you to become a part of that story. It does it in a subtle way that it invites you. It sort of sets up this idea and then it builds and builds and it gets you to kind of go, yeah, we've actually got to be part of that. So if that, if we took that in a context, it, out of context and played it in another area, a lot of audience members would kind of lean forward and engage with that concept because it's about freedom. However, as I said, Libertarianism has a brand problem because too often it gets into other areas where people are kind of suddenly get into an argument or they get into a belief, they just want to disagree or they want to fight because there's something that they're not connecting with emotionally. So it's really important for us as a movement to actually start thinking about what's that first little sip of water that we can get people to come in just to lean forward. Then let's invite them to these conferences where they can start to get a more balanced view of, of what it actually means to have have liberty and to understand some of the challenges that we have in our political system or in our leadership or in our businesses. Then get them to lean forward more into the various different, I guess, aspects because we don't all agree with each other here. We all have various different opinions within our own kind of community. However, there is this central idea that kind of unifies us. So we just need to bring people in because most people, when you bring it down to this idea of freedom, they'll, they'll accept you. Um, and so brand is important because uh, I, I want to just spend a bit of time looking at um, uh, my, my surname is Wimpy. Um, it's a terrible surname um, and it probably means why I learnt to be a sprinter as a little boy because uh, I, I was fast. Um, God didn't make me strong and a football player, he made me scrawny so, uh, and with a name like Wimpy I learnt to run fast. Um, so, um, uh, but, so when I started my first company it was called Orsino which was based on Duke Orsino out of Shakespeare. And basically, um, I was quite interested in Shakespeare. And so often, if you speak to the arts community, they see Shakespeare as this brilliant auteur. They see him as this incredibly single-minded, single-talented person that wrote these incredible plays that we still play today. Well, in actual fact, I believe Shakespeare's been misinterpreted. And I'm stealing some words from uh, one of my lecturers, David Court, at film school. I believe that Shakespeare was actually a, a true collaborator. He created a company of king's men and they learnt as they went. They performed, they adapted, they stole other ideas at the time and they adapted things to the social norms. It, to, be, to be honest, we become these purists today playing Shakespeare the way it was written hundreds of years ago, whether, where, 
maybe not hundreds of years ago. Um, but the idea is that we need to, um, we need to basically a- adapt our ideas as we present them. So as things get presented, we continue to refine them and adapt them. So Shakespeare understood this. He also understood brand because he was the strongest member of his company. So that's why Shakespeare is known as Shakespeare today because they put him forward in terms of his, as the lead collaborator. But I love Shakespeare because I found him adaptive. Uh, there's stories of, of him being business savvy when his, his overlord, his, um, he, he had an impasse with his landlord. So overnight, he um, pulled down his theatre took it across the Thames and rebuilt it, which I think is quite ingenious myself because in an industry like I'm in, which is constantly now going through a whole series of challenges, um, I, uh, you have to adapt. Um, okay, so basically I want to come back home to a, a sort of a silly, funny video that we did as a board of a bit of case in point because at the end of the day, I probably can show better than I can better than I can tell. Um, I do think it's very important that moving forward we learn how to become better at telling stories and that we understand quality. There's going to be a lot of risk involved and a lot of trial and error. I suggest as a filmmaker that the libertarian, that you guys as a movement make some bad films just so that you can make some better films so that you can make some great films. It starts with just making things. So get out there, start making, but get the feedback, learn, adapt, and keep making stuff because I think you'll find that that will help compel your audience and bring them through to you. But don't get into the details, as which has been said before and by many others over this conference. Get out of your head and get into your heart. So I want to show you a video that, um, let's see if we can make this happen when I find my mouse, here it is. Um, uh, we decided to make a video. With Christmas um, coming up, I'll do you think we should first. send something nice to our clients? Maybe we could send them a nice email or oh, something. Too small, think bigger. Uh, maybe a Christmas card? Everyone does that. Come on guys, bigger. Well, we could personalize it, put our faces on it. Yeah, I like that, closer. Well, seeing as we're a video production company, why don't we send them a video? Bingo. I want a nativity scene. Not just a half-hearted one with, with tea towels and tinsel. I want the whole shebang. Production values, camels. Karen. I want a real baby Jesus. You understand, Ben? But does it have to be my office? We all have to make sacrifices handy. And you've been here the shortest time. It's only going to be a week. Or two. So what you're saying is angels are actually warriors? That's right. And our clients will think I'm cool? <laughs> the coolest. Tolini, I said a camel, not a horse. We can put a hump on it. It's Jono! Not sure if this is supposed to go on the inside or the outside. Doesn't it make more sense if I play Mary? Elizna, I told you. As the owner of IndyMax Productions, it's metaphorical. It's really important that I play Mary. Now, do I look fat in this? How many times have I told you there are no elves in the nativity? I've been looking everywhere and everywhere and I can't find her. Honey, I don't know what I've done. I don't know where she is. Um, yeah, I took Mercy to work with me. What? Okay, is everyone ready? On the count of three, smile. One, two. Wait. Where's Sharon? This is humiliating. One, two, three. Indie Max! So we weren't really actors, but we wanted to kind of apply our story on us. We wanted to kind of reach out. It was Christmas. We wanted to reach out to our clients and do a bit of a branding exercise. So we wanted to be uh, authentic. We wanted to be genuine. And not at no point did we say how good our cameras were or how incredibly talented our writers were or, or how much money we could save you or how much other production companies were terrible and we are much better. We just wanted to sort of share a story that went out and just told people who we are. Um, it introduced people to our team. Um, none of them are actors. They're just having a bit of fun. And it sort of shared the heart and story and had po- poked a little bit of fun at us as a team. 
the video did really well um, in terms of it just went viral at a time at, at Christmas where people wanted to share and have a little bit of fun. So think about whoever you are in the room, whether you're part of a university or part of an organisation, think about how you can use story and the power of video to basically get people to lean forward and engage with your, your central ideas or your central purpose and themes. Um, because I want to come back here in a couple of years and see a change so that we don't have a brand problem. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you. If you want to, if you want to see a great video uh, that Ben had done, Google uh, Coalition for Obsolete Industries. That's a couple of years old now, I think, but it was a campaign on ride sharing in Australia. I don't know the gentleman's name, but he's the star of that video. <laughs> Sorry, but there's actually a lot of people who were at the conference that helped out with that one. Oh, really? Right. Anyway, jot that down. Uh, Coalition for Obsolete Industries, one of the most brilliant campaign videos I've ever seen. And it was, I think it was awarded in New York, actually. It was part of Atlas, so very deserving. Okay, Matt, you're up. Okay, first question. Are you guys warm enough? Because yes. yes. I feel it's not really a libertarian conference unless you're sort of miserably sweating in your chair. And, and I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm a little bit triggered right now. I'm snowflaking out a little bit because I have uh, a visceral dislike for podiums. <laughs> About five or six years ago, I was speaking at a conference in Belgrade, Serbia, and the, the dais was structured a lot like this, except it was a permanent structure. It was massive. The podium almost looked like the Iron Throne. <laughs> and it dawned on me while we were all sitting up elevated above the rest of you guys, that this, this structure is designed for authoritarians to tell everybody else what to think. Think about it, it's a one-way structure. I'm behind the podium, I feel a little bit smarter, my voice is a little bit deeper, but if I just come out here, if I just come out into the audience and hang out with you guys, I'm just a guy. And I tell that story, and I'm honest, like, the one thing we should do as libertarians is ban the dais and ban the podium and ban this thing. We don't need that. We're in a room small enough where we could actually talk to each other. And if you think about it, the entire history of the libertarian movement, classical, liberal, constitutional, conservative, whatever brand it is you want to embrace, we've been talking at people. We've been frustrated because they don't understand economics. They don't know what a billion dollars is. They don't understand the logic of downward sloping demand curves. They, they just don't get it. So instead of like uh, listening a little bit, we just talk louder. No, really, downward sloping demand curves. Why don't you understand? This is something that we need to deal with. A couple years ago, I was speaking at the Holocaust Museum and it was a gathering of a number of the best students who wanted to come to Washington, D.C. and make a difference, primarily Ivy League schools. I was a token libertarian amongst a bunch of progressives, and, and I thought it was safe to use the L word. I thought that I could say the word libertarian and that people would have some least understanding of what I was talking about. And the professor interrupted me. He said, hold on, Matt. Does anyone here know what a libertarian is. Best kids from the best schools. Ivy League. How many hands do you think went up? Zero. Zero. Oh, wow. That could suck, or that could be a perfect opportunity to rebrand ourselves, or brand ourselves. Starting from scratch, if we had a blank slate, we would sort of drop all of the economic logic, and I'm an economist, so I'm picking on myself here, we use these arguments as if human beings process information through economic logic. If you're listening this morning, I quoted our, our favorite whipping girl in the United States, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She infamously said it's more important to be morally right than factually correct. And we all hiss at her when she says that, but she's right. She's right, if, if you haven't morally connected with your audience, if you haven't gotten over hiding behind a podium, all the facts, all the figures, 
all of the economic logic, all of the history of socialism in practice, all of the millions of dead bodies created by bad ideology, no one's going to listen unless you're already in this room. We have to figure out a way to connect with our audience, and we have to do it through emotionally compelling stories told by people that are just like you. Not me, not experts, not the Marxist professor behind the podium who wants to tell you what to think, where there's no feedback loop. You can't tell him he's wrong because he's the expert. So that's what we're trying to do at Free the People. I think everybody up here is exploring this new territory. We have an opportunity because of technology, because of the easily accessible ability to produce video. Everyone here who has an iPhone can make a video that is emotionally compelling and beautiful and can connect with audiences that you've never been able to talk to before. But we have to think about it as a paradigm shift from what, everything that we've done up until this point. This isn't about books or white papers. It's got to be about something else. So we set out at Free the People to try to do some of this stuff. And honestly, we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know it all. I hired a bunch of actors and artists and videographers and storytellers. Um, I didn't hire any economists because one on staff is enough of a liability, and that's me. <laughs> and we started experimenting. The beautiful thing about YouTube and Facebook, Facebook maybe not so much anymore. It's kind of a dumpster fire, but there was a time when you could reach your audience through, through these, these platforms. But now Netflix and Hulu and even building your own channel through a website, there are ways to distribute content that just were inconceivable when I was a kid. We believe in one thing as libertarians. The Scottish Enlightenment talked about the wisdom of crowds. And yet our entire model has been totally top down totally dictating to people what they should believe instead of listening to our audience and letting them tell us what works, which is why you make a lot of video content. You throw it out there. You test it. You micro-target. You try to figure out if I want to talk to pro-Second Amendment lesbians in Vermont, you can do that now. And by the way, there is a substantial demographic. I spoke to them at the Democratic National Convention. And none of them knew it, but almost to a person, they were all libertarians. They were all libertarians. We can connect with that audience. We can connect with thousands of other audiences in any language and if we tell those stories. The, the one thing that we need is a little bit of humility, a little bit of understanding that we don't really know what we're doing, a little bit of listening. We don't listen very well. I'm part of a progressive working group. After I left FreedomWorks, Terry and I left FreedomWorks to build Free the People, and I joined this progressive working group called the Civic Collaboratory. I'm their token libertarian guy. I used to be a Tea Party organizer, so they're, they're kind of shocked that I'm not a complete monster, and, and they let me fit in there. The first day I spent with them, I realized that even though they were speaking perfect, correct English, I literally had no idea what they were saying. Because they have tribal language, because they use words in, in context and differently fundamentally than libertarians ever would, than conservatives would, they're, they're talking about things in a way that, and I was struggling to listen and to understand. And it dawned on me afterwards, once I started to understand sort of their tribal language, that a lot of the, a lot of the words we use, uh, let's use rule of law. Rule of law to everyone in this room hopefully means treating everybody just like everybody else under the laws, regardless of who your parents are, regardless of whether or not you have a guy in Washington, regardless of the color of your skin. That's not what it means to other people. It means the boot of the man on your neck. It might mean discriminatory policies under mass incarceration that punishes certain kids from certain neighborhoods and not others. So why do we use these words? And better yet, why did we let the other side steal all of our words? Liberal in the United States is a dirty word. 
Community is not a word that I ever hear conservatives utter. Even though we're the guys, right? We believe in the power of voluntary association. We're, we're the guys that believe that neighbors and communities solve problems by, by cooperation and, and working things out and taking personal responsibility to help a neighbor in trouble. That's our entire model. That's what freedom is. But the word community has been taken by somebody with a different meaning. Same with justice. Why don't we use the word justice anymore? Now it means social justice. Hayek said, I don't even know what that means. You add social to the word justice and it, it immediately eliminates the meaning of the term in the first place. So let's think a little bit about our audience. Let's listen a little bit. And my final point was let's find stories and better yet storytellers who are sympathetic. People that can tell in a very visceral way what it means when the government tells you that you can't do X. One of our favorite videos is about a woman named Christine Stenquist, a woman who was, uh, uh, had a benign brain tumor and literally died on the table when she was 22, 23 years old. She spent the next 15 years raising her family on the couch in undescribably horrible pain. She tried everything. She tried all the drugs, all the treatments, all the surgeries, and she finally went to her dad, who was a drug enforcement agency agent, and said, Dad, I want to try cannabis. It transformed her life. She's from Utah. So when we told the story of being allowed to choose medical cannabis in the very conservative state of Utah, we told a family value story through the eyes of Christine. By the way, it's also a healthcare story, right? It's a story about a mom who got her kids back because she had a healthcare choice that she was free to make. There's endless numbers of stories like that. I was talking about beer this morning and we sort of joke about it, but it's a real thing. I make videos about beer. They do a lot better than my videos about the non-aggression principle. You'd be shocked to know. You know why? Because people like beer. People don't know what the hell you're talking about when you talk about the non-aggression principle. So I guess I'll end it there. Um, every one of you guys has an ability to tell stories like this. Start with your personal story. The reason I talk about my battle with cancer is that it's a personal story that might be a vehicle to talk about economics. It might be a vehicle to talk about choice. It might be a vehicle to talk about medical innovation and all of the cool things that happen when people are free. But the hook, you notice how uncomfortable the room got this morning when Terry talked about stage four cancer. People were listening. People cared. And once people care, they're willing to discover along with you how you might solve that problem together. Final thought. John Perry Barlow, who was a lyricist for the Grateful Dead, went on to start a, a nonprofit called the Electronic Frontier Foundation, cyber libertarian. He was one of the first guys to predict in the 1990s the power of the internet. He called it the right to know, that, that the, the internet and Google and search would level the playing field between insiders, the guys behind the podium who'd read all the books and had all the degrees versus that guy in, and, and he, he talks about a, a random guy in Upland, Mali, who had the ability for the first time to learn everything about molecular biology without getting a degree from Harvard, without getting anyone's permission. The only limitation is your ability to work and understand and strive to do so. Now, of course, the internet has since become a swirling cesspool of garbage, right? Mm -hmm. We had that romantic view of what it could be, and then it, then it turned to crap because of the kind of clickbait that I hate so much. If any of you guys are, are doing that clickbait stuff, you're actually hurting the movement. You, maybe you're building your Facebook page, but you're hurting the movement. Every time we, we do one of those goofy pictures of AOC, staring marvelously at our, at our garbage disposal, it doesn't help. 
Um, we, could do, we could do the high-minded stuff. The counter-counter-revolution in social media, you can find it when young people are curating for themselves content that they want to watch on YouTube. And by the way, it might be five minutes. It might be three hours. If you listen to Joe Rogan, you know some people will actually consume three hours worth of content if it is an authentic, open conversation about ideas and values. So let's experiment with all that stuff. Let, let's do podcasts. Let's do comedy. Let's do short stories. It's got to be video. It's got to be t speaking to people who aren't like us, people that would never come to this conference. Because five years from now, when you guys are up here hiding behind a podium pretending that you're smarter than you are, I want this group to be 10 times bigger, 100 times bigger. I want it to be all of the people that we've brought to this movement globally that are curious. They're trying to figure out stuff. They don't want to be in this tribal warfare between the right and the left, the red and the blue, the conservatives and the liberals, whatever those camps are. They don't want to be that. They're, they're looking. They're liberty curious. And it's our job to connect with them. Thank you. Yeah.